It's whom the chances of working in the first shot is okay. Is is that fine now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, this laptop is the audio is coming now it's fine. No, 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 I think now it's fine. Yeah, I'm just going to sit there. Yeah, I think Zoom is the real test for computer science. So, uh, so I'm going to uh, explain what these terms mean. What does Boolean function and synthesis mean, and what is knowledge compilation? But before that, uh, I want to say that whatever I'm going to talk about uh, is joint work with uh, my colleagues and students. So uh, in particular, Akshay, uh, Jatin, Aman, Sahil, Shudhya, Pri, Shetan, and Krishna. And uh, also uh, a lot of discussions that I have benefited from with uh, colleagues elsewhere, like uh, Rod Freed, Kuldeep Mail, and Moshe Bharti. So uh, let's get going. Uh, so let, let me first try to uh, tell you and hopefully uh, convince you that this is an interesting problem to work on. Uh, and I'm going to use this uh, acronym for Boolean functional synthesis, otherwise it occupies a large part of the slide and subsequent slides. Uh, so suppose uh, you're trying to design a system, software, hardware, whatever, firmware, uh, and all you know is that there are some inputs x1 to xn and some outputs y1 to yn. And you should design the system such that uh, it satisfies a specification. Okay. Now, if the specification already tells you that y1 is x1 plus x2 and yn is x5 plus x6, then it's a very simple problem. Okay. We have basically told you how to design the system. But as we will just see in a slide or two, that sometimes the specification is not given in this form where the output is given as a function of the inputs. Sometimes it's much more easier to write the specification as a relation between inputs and outputs without saying how the output should be defined as functions of the inputs. So therefore, I'm going to write this as a formula between inputs and outputs. Uh, where this formula could specify a relation and there could be multiple functions of the inputs that satisfy them. Okay. Oh, some chat window opened up. Okay. All right. So this is a game between computer scientists and Zoom. Every time you think that <laughs> you've taken care of Zoom street surprises. Okay, so uh, our goal is to synthesize basically functions from the inputs to the outputs, such that when I substitute that function in place of the outputs, the specification holds. Specification is just a logical formula. Yeah. So what is Boolean about the whole thing? 
the variable the input and the output or yeah so i'm i'm going to in this talk i'm going to focus completely on inputs outputs being boolean this being a boolean formula everything so there is a version of this where these can be more general like first order logic formulas but today's talk i'm just going to focus on boolean. so when you say specification mode c is equal to something that you no 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 this is a formula on this this is a formula on these variables okay and i'm just going to show you some examples uh so for example i could say that x1 or negation y1 or phi has to be true phi has to become true yeah so, yeah. so our goal is to synthesize functions from inputs to outputs such so that when i substitute those functions over here this formula works and uh and we'll soon see that sometimes uh, we deal with you know specifications formulas like this where there are some inputs for which no matter what outputs we provide the formula will not become true so and you know one might say actually there is one section of the uh, synthesis community which says that such specifications are not interesting <laughs> they are called unrealizable and we will forget about them but uh, i will show you that there are some very interesting examples in which this formula uh, cannot be satisfied for every x but it still makes sense to find out what the y should be as function of x for those x's where there is some y so basically what i am saying is that for every x uh as long as there is a y so so think of a parenthesis over here for every x as long as there is a y such that phi x y can be made true or uh, it should be the case that phi fx phi xfx can also be made true and of course the implication in the other direction holds trivial okay. so if there is a fx as a phi xfx so it's then certainly there is this the y as a phi yeah so the parenthesis is over here i thought the parenthesis no no, no the parenthesis is over here it's the y such that phi xy so the parenthesis is here Yes, that's what I mean. Because for some x's, there may not exist y's. Yes. Right. So for all those x's where there exists a y, this should be. No, yeah. I think I am very sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, I see. That's what. Yeah. So, so you think of this as one formula yes. on X. Think of this as another formula on X. Yeah. And then for all X, this formula yeah. is equivalent to that formula. Yeah. So that's what I mean. That there is. Okay. Yeah. So I think there is. <laughs> I think maybe we have two sets. One two sets and one. Right. Right. So one over here. Yes. And then. Got it. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Piyush. Uh, okay. And uh, in the literature, such functions are also called Skolem functions for these variables which they are replacing uh, in the formula five. Okay. So, so functions typically mean that for every x is a unique variable. Are you going to generalize that? Or? No. I mean, so this is a function. Yes. So one. So this function for every x will give me a unique y. That's good. Yeah, but there could be multiple functions which I could substitute here. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just show you some yeah, examples. Yeah, like, Maybe that's right. We get to the example. Oh, so simple but not so easy. Yeah. Okay. So and this is completely Boolean. Okay. So I have a a two n bit input. Call it x and two n bit outputs. Called y1 and y2. Okay, and this is a specification which is the, uh, you know, I mean, think think of it as talking about bit vectors of size n. So I'm saying that x as a two n bit vector interpreted as an unsigned integer is the product of y1 and y2 interpreted as unsigned integers, and the product is unsigned integer multiplication. And y1 is not equal to The n bit vector which represents one, and y two is not equal to the n bit vector which represents one, 
And if you look at this for a minute, you'll realize that it's not hard to write down this formula, even if I were to blast it out at the level of individual bits. So be at most O of n squared, right? The size of this formula. And uh, now I say that, okay, here's my specification. This tells me exactly the relation between inputs and outputs. Okay. So this says that the input yes. is a product of the outputs. Yes. And none of the output should be one. Factoring this. Exactly. Right? So, <clears throat> and, and I'm asking, so, you know, I mean, if I flip these arrows, if I say y1 and y2 are inputs and x is the output, this is a trivial synthesis problem. Just multiply, right? But the specification kind of remains the same. It's just the identification of the inputs and outputs that changes. And the point is that this specification is uh, a fairly compact specification. It's O of n squared. In, you know, suppose I present it as a circuit. It's no more than O of n squared. But now if I say that x is my input and y1 and y2 are my outputs, yes, as you rightly said, I'm asking for non-trivial factors of x. And of course, for this, we don't know yet whether there are polynomial size circuits, right? And of course, if we could solve this problem efficiently, we break the systems. And so this hopefully, uh, you know, illustrates the point that I can come up with simple specifications for which the synthesis problem is really hard, particularly if I'm talking about efficient synthesis. Right? So, just a minute. so here, the whenever possible clause is like if x was a prime, then there is nothing that's exactly. 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 So that's my, that's my next oh, bullet. That is, is this specification satisfiable for all x? Clearly not. If x is a prime, then I cannot have any y1 and y2, which means this. But I hope all of you will agree that this is still an interesting problem, right? We are talking about non trivial factorization. But no, it's not. Yeah, the equal to one is saying that otherwise I can always find one of them to be one and the other to be else. Right, so I want to sort of get rid of one. Right? Yeah, it's not equal to one. All of these are unsigned integers. All ones universal, like minus one. That's how you can do it. No, so they are interpreted as unsigned integers. Oh, I have not. Yeah, no. So, uh, yeah, so, but you know, I mean, there is a large part of the synthesis community which will say, okay, this specification is not interesting at all because there are some exits for which I can't find ones. And what I'd like to say is that, no, no, I mean, yes, there are some exits for which I can't find ones, but, you know, it's, it's still an interesting question to ask. And, uh, and in fact, if, you know, if I could synthesize the system, I could, I could use it as a primality checker, right? Because for every x, I know that whenever there exists y1 and y2, which satisfies this spec, this function will give me that y1 and y2. So if I don't know what x, whether x is a prime number or not, in case I feed it, I get some y1 and y2, I take those y1 and y2, multiply them, check it back with x. If it is not equal, then x was prime. Okay, that's right. You don't apply a primarity one x there are other cases than primes as well. Just like two into prime. Just like two into prime. No, it's fine. For every number other than a prime. Except two and between there, right? Yeah. And y1 and y2 are n bits. So to be like p could also still be more than n bits. So if you multiply two n bit integers, you can only get a two n bit integer, right? No, I guess the wrong question is that it might be the case that the other factor, the only factor you have requires more than n bits to represent. Because maybe the, I mean, the other factor is, is, yeah, the other factor is just too large. It's just one bit smaller than the, than the size it of it. cannot be more than the square root, right? No, the smaller one cannot be more. Than yeah, but the larger one will be more than the square I see. Okay. So, okay, maybe you can pad up additional bits over here to say however large the factor can be, right? Uh, Yeah, yeah, you're right. So, but we can maybe, maybe we can make these even two n bits. Right. Yeah. 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 That's not a problem. But I still require this. 
that x has to be y1 times y2 and uh, i guess even if we make these two n bits nothing changes over here in the sense of still quadratic and all of that so uh, so the, the the point is uh, okay so uh, so this is the problem that we want to solve that we'll be given a specification like this from which it is not clear uh, how to generate the outputs as functions of the inputs uh, but you know we still want to come up with these functions even when we know that there are some x's for which there are no y's okay. yes sir the input is that formula yes the input is the formula and the ident the partitioning of the variables into what are input and variables you want, the, and you want, to, you want a function exactly so so the input is a formula with the labeling of the variables as which are inputs and outputs and i want this function over here which will generate the outputs okay so if we agree on this problem now it turns out that uh, you know this has a long and storied history uh, starting with uh, seminal work of, uh, actually this was studied you know much more intensely in the context of first order logic by perhaps colen and then uh, jake herbrand uh, but their uh, focus was on the existence of such functions and not how to generate these functions Right. and if you actually go to first order logic i mean in some other work uh, we have shown that i mean these functions of course exist but most of them are not computed so there is no no hope of actually even getting this practice so are you you know all of this links to the implicit function theorem that you were setting are you okay with that analogy or uh, in the, in the boolean setting everything can be represented explicitly Yes, you you don't need to get into that. Yeah, I don't need to get into that. Uh, but of course, there is a complexity issue that this does blow up. You can already see that. Right? And what we'll try to so the focus of this talk will be when can we do it efficiently and uh, what can we do, right? But then also, sorry, as you mentioned, you have an implicit function in the question: Can you create that implicit function? Can you identify it? That's implicit. Yeah, it is similar. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and it turns out that uh, we can trace this problem even further back, even before Skolin came into the picture. Although these are called Skolin functions, uh, and it goes back to what are called Boolean unifiers, which uh, George Boole worked on long time back. Uh, a Boolean unifiers are not exactly the same as Boolean function, but there is a very close connection. Okay, so uh, and uh, there are many many applications of this problem, even for the even in the Boolean case of the problem, and I've just listed some of those, like you know, certain classes of programs in this problem, certified quantified Boolean formulas checking, satisfiability checking. uh quantifier elimination of course uh, circuit repair reactive synthesis and the whole bunch of things and of course uh, not surprisingly you know so many different applications are there mm -hmm. yeah so what do you mean by synthesis how you output yes yeah i'm, I'm going to come to that <clears throat> yeah that, that's that's actually an important question how how should i output it uh so so as you know, see that there are several existing approaches and uh, you know let me not read those out but what i'm going to focus today on is this thing for knowledge compilation this uh, synthesis okay uh so uh, you know coming to your question about how do we represent the inputs and how do we represent the output so it does turn out that the difficulty of the problem represent uh, depends on the representations uh in this talk i will consider the inputs and outputs represented as circuits as boolean circuits okay. uh it turns out that if you require the outputs in some special form like you know whatever maybe binary decision diagrams or something like that then the complexity uh, picture changes a little bit but for this talk i'll just say that The inputs are circuits, the outputs are circuits. Any circuit will be fine, and/or not. 
<clears throat> so with that representation of inputs and outputs, how hard is this? Uh, so as I said, the, the both the spec and the scolem functions are going to be represented as negation normal form circuits. Uh, negation normal form is you know, it's easy, you just push the negations down so it doesn't impose any restriction really, but it helps in the analysis. Uh, and uh, it's not very hard to see that this is going to be an PR, right? Uh, so, of course, you know, I mean, this is uh, a decision problem complexity. We are trying to do a kind of functional problem over here. But I mean, I could just say, I mean, think of a specification where everything. Uh, Right, I mean, it's like for all x exists y. Let's say there are no x's, it just becomes exists y. So no inputs, all outputs, it's just a satisfying problem. So, so if I uh, have a way of solving this efficiently, I can solve the satisfiability problem right? along with the weakness. Right? So the question about the function, uh, about the existence and the synthesis, which you were talking about in a couple of slides before this, so that was for. Uh, for some other kind of functions? Uh, in, in that uh, the picture about Skolem and her brand and all of that. Yeah, so this one about the existence and yeah. synthesis. So this is about not about Boolean functions. This is not about Boolean functions. And Boolean functions, and Booleans, we know that you know in the worst case we can write out a fixed table, right? So but this is in the context of first order logic. Uh, and, mm, Almost everything that you can, and there are very few things that you can actually come up with a halting tubing machine which will compute the function. So, maybe this is another way of the same thing or something, then again there might be issues. But then your specification is a formula by definition, which is a finite string, so it has a finite number. Even the verification problem, given phi and f, you can whether F is a valid solution for C, verification problem on the quality is not an NP, but it's already the second level of the hierarchy or something. No, no, for all X, there exists a Y. No, the Y given by whatever function you are specifying. So you need to check this. That plug it into C and check if that works for all X. You need to check that. If the opposite Y is the actual one, you have to it's, it's at least in second order, second uh, order. Okay. So you uh, yeah, if I guess what Rampasad is saying is that this thing you can check. Yeah, the issue is that if there were some examples for which, yeah. So it is in the second level. Yeah. Second level. Yeah. So, uh, and you know, what about space complexity? So, once again, it's not very hard to show that unless the polynomial hierarchy collapses to the second level, uh, the second level is important. In this. Uh, there will be uh, specifications for which there any scolem function represented as a circuit must be super polynomial in size. And unless the similarly, unless the non-uniform exponential time hypothesis fails, I mean, of course, it's a very strong condition, but you know, there will be a I mean, why is it non-uniform? Because we are basically saying that you can come up with different scolem functions for different things. Uh, but and so that's kind of like uh, painting a gloomy picture, saying there's not much hope in doing efficient synthesis, but then. Uh, it turns out that uh, if this specification is represented in some special forms, right, and these are, I mean, that, that's going to be the main part of the talk today, what are these special forms, then it is indeed uh, solvable in time polynomial in the size of the formula. Uh, I mean, these are Boolean circuits again, but these are Boolean circuits in some special forms. Uh, and of course, uh, time is following this. Space of polynomial. And so that is the part that I'm going to dig deeper into that what are these kinds of forms? What is, is there a necessary and sufficient condition for this form? What do we, how do we compile to this form and all of that? So that will be the remainder of the Okay. So, uh, 
So essentially the question we are asking is that can I compile a specification given as an arbitrary Boolean circuit in negation normal form to another form that facilitates efficient synthesis. And of course, because of these lower bounds that we talked about, I mean, if that form has to facilitate efficient synthesis, the compilation has to take the hit. And so it will be worst case uh, interactive, right? But uh, we still find, and this is where I'll show that uh, experiments do show that this is still, I mean, yes, in the worst case, it will be bad. But it's like saying, you know, binary decision diagrams are bad in general. But there's a whole bunch of things that can be efficiently compiled to binary decision diagrams. And once you're there, everything is fine. <clears throat> and what we'll show is that, and of course, uh, I mean, what I'll show is that binary decision diagrams, of course, facilitate efficient synthesis as well. But we don't need that's too strong. So they're a much weaker form, exponentially weaker form that can facilitate synthesis. Okay. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the other point is that, uh, you know, when we're compiling these specifications to other forms, we don't want to, we don't want to do the compilation in a way that makes it, that makes it easy to get one scoring function and hard to get another scoring function, because what scoring function I really need may be very context specific. I mean, for the same specification, one scoring function may be good for me, the other may be good for you. So, so we don't want to sort of get a scolar function and say, hi, huh, here, here's this one, right? <clears throat> okay, so, so this is what we call, uh, what in the literature is called knowledge compilation. And the picture looks something like this, that you are given a specification, let's say as a circuit, or you know, if it is given as a CNF, some more optimizations are possible, but we'll just focus on circuits. And we are also told what are the inputs and outputs. This is important. I showed you that factorization specification. If I flip the role of inputs and outputs, it suddenly becomes very easy. Uh, and I want to get it into a certain form such that from there, uh, you know, I can basically take standard logic optimization tools and algorithms and get my desired scoring function. So the focus of this talk is really on this part. It's not on this part. And what we will see is that as we are compiling down to this part, some scoring functions will come for free. But if you want to do some more optimization, you say that for the minimum number of k's, whatever height is reduced, just that, then you can do more things. But certain things will come for free. So uh, there are two questions that we want to answer. So one is uh, how do we define such a form? And the second is, uh, and this, as I'll show you, that there is some very nice property about scolin functions, which allows us to define these in a nice way called scolin basis. And how do we compile to this form? And this I will talk about. Yeah. So, okay. if the output y for the single bit, mm -hmm. is that that's easy? That's easy. Yes. Why is that? I'll just show you. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's very good because we are. You're almost prompting the next few slides. <laughs> no, it's excellent. Okay, so see, I'll, I'll show you that the one output case is easy to solve. Uh, and the multi output case, we try to reduce it to the one output case one step at a time, and that brings in some complication. Uh, and that's so, so I'm coming to that in a couple of slides. Okay, so. Uh, so towards defining this representation for all the smaller <laughs> functions that can arise from the specification, uh, we'll say that a set of Boolean functions on these variables uh, has a basis. So the basis is, once again, two functions. Uh, if they're mutually inconsistent, so you know, if this is the set of all assignments of x, and a is a function represented by that subset, and b is this annular region which doesn't intersect with okay? I mean, I've drawn it there like that for a specific reason, uh, which is this, that for every function f in this set, uh, the function can be represented as something that completely includes a and that doesn't go outside. So we say that a set of Boolean functions on x has a basis uh, this, if it satisfies these two properties, and clearly, not every set of Boolean functions will have a basis. This is not hard to say. But it turns out, yeah, 
Because the A, X, and B, X are functions. Are functions. Yeah, yes. they're like subsets of the set of assignments. And so A, X, and B, X is empty. The intersection is empty. Yeah. But I mean, in your picture. The yeah, so B is the annular region. B is the annular region. So B is the annular Yeah, yeah. So B is the annular region. So, uh, one can, yeah, I'll, I'll just show you why I defined it that way in the next slide. Yeah, but I mean, one can also define it the other way, but I mean, then that, a later step becomes like, I mean, I have to write it in a different way. Right? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, clearly, when drawing this diagram, it makes sense to say these containing A. But uh, yeah, but, but let's just go with the definition and just tell you why I wrote it that way. And so uh, clearly not every set of functions has a, has a basis like this, right? But very interestingly, the set of all scolem functions for a variable in a given specification, doesn't matter what the specification is. The set of all scolem functions has not only such a basis, but a unique such basis, modulo ordering of the outputs. So if you say that I'm going to generate the basis for the outputs in this order, y1 first, then y3, then y2, then y5, then not only does it have basis, but it has a unique basis. So second item, what is it for all, that for every f of x in the class, yeah. a x should imply f x, which should imply a x or b of x? Yeah. So b is this annular region here. Yeah. So a x or b x is this bigger circle. Right, ax or bx is everything within this big circle. Yeah. And what I what we are saying is that every function should lie outside this inner circle and within the bigger circle. Okay. So that's what ax implies fx, which implies. Yeah, the blue region includes the chain. No, it's not That's the first part. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe I should have said that Bx contains A, B contains A. Maybe that would have been easier to see. Uh, but I'll just tell you, I mean, uh, coming back to Piyush's question, why we do this, why, why I wrote it this way. Uh, uh, so this is actually this connection to, you know, whatever, 40 years of work on logic optimization where we have things called onsets and don't care sets. So onsets are the set of assignments for which the function must evaluate to true, and don't care sets are the set of assignments where I don't care what the value is. And that B, that annular region is exactly that don't care set. Okay. And uh, if I get the A and B like that center part in the annular region, I can just feed it as is to a logic optimization algorithm and say, please optimize. Here's my onset, here's my don't care set. Otherwise, I have to do B minus A and B. Yeah, and that's also good. And outside, white region is the offset. It's the offset. The white region is the offset, the red region is the onset, and the animal region is the don't care set. So, you know, this is a little bit of 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 a little bit so if you go back to phi, it had x as inputs and y as outputs. And I'm trying to get the scolem functions as functions of x. So these are all possible solutions to the synthesis problem. All possible solutions to the synthesis problem admit such a basis. The entire set of solutions is exactly all the set of functions. So I can find out a function ax and I can find out a function bx. So that anything that you take in between them will satisfy, will turn out to be a legitimate scolem function, and every legitimate scolem function lies between these two. So this is like a, a more abstract uh, and, and a general statement. Uh, so the simple example I have in mind is it's a case where it's like a linear relation, like a parity of uh, say you know, y1 times k1 plus y1 that's your know, function. And in that case, the solution space is actually a linear space. And, and basic could really mean a basic, but this is something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, okay, yeah. This is, I mean, it is motivated by, you know, basis of uh, linear spaces, but uh, this can, yeah. 
Uh, so, uh, I mean, the, the, the interesting point here is that not every set of functions, uh, and uh, this is a simple counting argument can show you that basis. Not every set of functions can have such a basis. But very interestingly, the set of scolium functions has such a basis, and not only that, it has a unique such basis, modulo ordering the graph. So, the quantifier of the pi here is for all pi, for all formula pi is. Yeah, so you pick any. Boolean specification and inputs and outputs, and for yeah, and you fix an ordering of the outputs, and you say I'm going to get the basis in that order. All right. So so let me quickly show you. Uh, yeah. So so this is the reason why I took that angular tree chain because that directly identifies Boolean per se. You know, now coming to uh, Rinal's question, that for a single output spec uh, where there's just one output. This actually turns out to be easy. Uh, in fact, you know, we can show that A is exactly this and B is exactly this. I mean, here you can see what's going on. I'm saying that, well, whether the output is one or zero, it doesn't matter. The value of the specification is the same, right? So it's really a don't care. For all those values of X, uh, right? I've, I've not shown the X over here, but for all those values of X, where whatever function you get by substituting Y is one, it is semantically equivalent to whatever function you get by substituting by zero, then how why should it matter whether y is one or zero? And so uh, that really is the don't care set. And the onset is really saying that for all those value effects where the specification evaluates to true when you set y to one, but the specification evaluates to false when you set y to zero. Right? So for one output case, this is very easy. And not only that, this A. I mean, it's, it's easy to see, right? We said every scolium function is going to lie in this region. So in fact, A is one such scolium function. So for the moment I'm getting a basis, I'm also giving you a scolium function for free, but not only that, I'm giving you a representation for all scolium functions. Okay. So single output case is solved. Uh, for multiple outputs, uh, in that in the definition of A, yeah. Uh, so it was not necessary that every function has that onset don't care in the definition of F. So there would be functions in there, there would be uh, functions which have onset A, don't care B, and offset A in the document, which are not in that family F. No, no, no. So so I said that a set F has a base set. Oh, sorry. A, a set F has a basis if these properties hold, and not every set F has a basis. No, no, no. So it, it will always be in between. So when I'm doing synthesis, you give me any specification phi, Boolean specification phi, you pick any output, right? And the set of all scolum functions for that output, the set of all scolum functions for that output, yeah. okay. admits a basis. Yes, but, uh, but, uh, but what about the other functions, the non scolum functions, also? But I think his question is to put the second blue bullet. Uh -huh. You don't say that fx is the f, if and only if oh, the right hand side is true. But uh, you are not saying that I can substitute a. But yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. So for every fx in f, this is true, and anything that is true, yes, it's 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 yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. I don't know how <laughs> Yeah, fx is in f if and only if this condition holds. Yeah. Yes. Is that okay. So uh, the one output case is easy. Now, uh, what do we do for multiple outputs? So uh, it turns out, you know, I can fix an ordering. So basically, I, if I can reduce this multiple output case to the one output case by fixing an ordering, I can do this. So if I define, you know, that take this thing, which may have multiple outputs here, but I quantify over the first few outputs, then I can similarly define something. Uh, you know, after doing this quantification, I can find something. But of course, this colon basis will be in terms of, you know, yj plus one to ym and x, 
and the remaining variables. But if I actually do them in sequence, I already have those in terms of the x variable, so I can do the substitution and get that. So it's it's very similar, I guess. For one output, it's easy to see. For multiple outputs, it's very similar. If I can do this, right? And so the real bottleneck is, can I do this? And uh, and you know, one might think that, oh, well, okay. I mean, if it, it looks like being able to compute a circuit for this is a sufficient condition for being able to get this column basis vector efficiently. Uh, is it also true the other way around? I mean, of course, if I have the scolem basis vector, then I have the scolem functions. And if I substitute the scolem functions, I get the result of existentially quantified now. Right? So the other side is easy to see. If I already have the scolem basis, I have the scolem functions. I mean, one part, the A part is definitely a scolem function. And you substitute any scolem function for that variable, you have quantified out that variable. That was the definition of scolem functions. Right? So this is really not just uh, a sufficient condition, but uh, but it also turns out to be a necessary condition. That if you have to synthesize scolem functions efficiently, you will have to quantify how variable is efficient. And if you can do one, you can do the other. Efficient. Okay. So uh, so let let's get to some examples. Let's you know, try to be a bit more concrete. So suppose I've given you uh, this as a negation normal form circuit, and I want to obtain x this y phi on the circuit. And just to keep things simple, let's take uh, let's take a single output variable, but let's not utilize. Uh, I mean, for a single output variable, I know I can get the basis very easily. But I'm saying that let me try to do the quantification. Let me not try to do the basis trick. So the simplest way to do it is, yes, so suppose this is my NNN circuit and there are output variable and its negation at the leads. The simplest way to do this is to follow the definition, make two copies, set y to one in one, set y to zero in the other, or one. This is the definition of existential quantification. But the problem with this is that it doubles right, every time. So the question is, we ask that can we avoid this doubling and uh, under certain conditions, we can avoid, and it turns out that every circuit can be compiled to that. What does the final circuit? It just asks, does there exist a Y which makes the formula, which makes the definition? Yeah, but this is a formula on X, right? Yeah. This is a Boolean formula on X. Yeah. And this this circuit represents that Boolean formula on X. Its leaves are only X. That's right. So it represents the formula that there exists Y T. Yes. So and there exists y phi of x y is a boolean function on x. On x, and this is the circuit for that. This is yeah one way of representing that circuit. Okay. But of course, this way of obtaining that. So basically, from a circuit for phi, I'm trying to get a circuit for x y. Because if I can do this quantification easily, then I can get this scolem basis. Right. That's that's what we showed in the last slide. Yeah, this one for multiple outputs. If I can do this quantification easily, then I can get this polar basis. So I'm now trying to focus on how to get this, how to do this quantification easily as a circuit. Right? Because I mean, if I get these as circuits, it's actually very simple to do this. Just set some values to constants. Uh, okay, so uh, so this is so this is one way to do it, but it's not going to scale because of the potential doubling. So we ask, when can we do without scaling? And so here is one observation, at least for this example, and it, I'll show you that it's not just for this example, this actually arises quite often. Uh, so if, if I look at the formula here, when I set y to one, it turns out to be x1. And if I look at the formula here, when I set y to zero, it turns out to be x1 or x2. And x1 logically implies x1 or x2. Which means that the formula with y set to one logically implies the formula with y set to zero. And whenever this happens, we say y is negative unit in the formula. And when we have negative unitness, I can just pick this up. And it's not hard to see. I'm ordering them up, but whenever this is true, the other side is also true. So why bother with this side? Just take the other side. And of course, there's nothing special about the direction of the implication. If it happened the other way, I take the left side. So, uh, so it, you know, so if we have this special condition, which 
Of course, it may not happen always, but then it's easy. So it just looks like you know there are some conditions under which we can. Now, what we don't have in this, right? I mean, we can't expect to get that lucky every time. And this can be painful uh, in the sense that doing finding a circuit for X is Y P can be painful if we don't have the And in particular, at a very high level, this is exactly the condition that makes it difficult. That you have, remember, this is an NNF circuit. So it has only AND and OR gates inside. So if you have an AND gate, to which something can reach from a Y leaf and a negation Y leaf. Ys are the outputs, remember? That's the variable I'm trying to quantify out. So this is an NNF circuit, so only at the leaves I'll have all the negations. So if I have an AND gate sitting somewhere inside, which can have things coming up from both Y and negation Y at the same time, and then there is a path that's enabled all the way to the output, uh, it would appear that this, this is a very benign case. I mean, Y and negation Y, is zero, right? So it's zero propagating to the output. But uh, if this thing is present in your circuit, then it is difficult to get exists Y pi as a circuit starting from the circuit for pi. And it turns out that this is almost a necessary and sufficient condition. Currently, this is a sufficient condition I'm showing you, and then I'll show you a necessary and sufficient condition, which is some refinement of this. So this is uh, sorry. So those parts have other gates only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like odds and yeah, yeah. So and they take other things as inputs. So as long as all of those are allowing these things to flow up, as long as your circuit has this, this is what makes it difficult to get exist y pi as a circuit starting point. Uh, the negation of y and y, they meet only at end, but they could be under a subtree of that. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if they meet at an OR and then that OR feeds to the AND, then it's fine. Okay. But I am finding two, two disjoint path. paths which yeah, come in. Yes, yes, that's what two disjoint paths which come in. Okay. Uh, and so this is what we call conflict with respect to Y, and this hinders the efficient quantification in the sense of getting a circuit for X is Y pi starting from circuit for pi. And this almost looks like a structural condition, right? I can look at a circuit and figure out whether there are sparks and all of that. Uh, and if you think a little bit, if you have a binary decision diagram, it actually never has such a path because it's always like a Shannon decomposition, right? You say Y and something or negation Y and something. So Y and negation Y. So binary decision diagrams are good for getting this thing, but they're too strong. We don't need all of them. So uh, yeah, this almost looks like a structural condition. And of course, if we have a structural condition, we are in good shape, but we don't need this structural condition. We can dilute this a little or weaken this a little bit. And so really the weakening is that, you know, there is a Y and negation Y and I'm asking that, and what I've done here is that I've labeled that, renamed that negation Y using some Y hat. And I'm asking, can I get this output to behave like Y and Y hat for any assignment over here? But this is really asking, can that Y and negation Y propagate all the way to the output? But if I just put negation Y here, this would become false. And maybe for some other conditions here also, it might become false. So I'm really trying to ask, is there a way to set, and set the other values, other variables to some values, such that these things go all the way up to the root? As by at this point, why is the single variable and these are all the occurrences of that one variable? Is that how it Or is why is a single why is a single variable? But these are all these that can be labeled that, that are labeled. Okay, exactly. And I've considered a case where there is just a single output, yeah. right? just to say, yeah. I'll just show the more general. So if if this is clear, uh, in fact, this turns out to be. Uh, you know, generalization. So if this happens, we say it's the conflict, and we say that this pi is the counter example to conflict freeness. This is the reason why we are having the conflict. Uh, and of course, there could be many such pi's. Uh, and if if it does not, which means that there is no such pi, so you can see that this is like a you know invoking an NPO thing to ask this question. Uh, then it turns out that uh, I can do an efficient quantification. 
And how do I do the efficient quantification? I just set y and y hat both to 1 in the circuit, and that's it. The output is semantically equivalent with the square so. Hmm. so this looks like is a sufficient condition for this to happen. And in fact, indeed, it's a sufficient condition, but there's a slight tweak of this, which also comes in this system. Oh, so, uh, and it's not very hard to see that every phi x, y admits a conflict. You just write it out in DNF, for example, this is a form. It's always conflict free. Uh, but, you know, I mean, one of the questions that we ask is that um, do we really need to go to DNF? And can we just look at these counter examples and rectify these conflicts? So, uh, so here, maybe I'll just quickly show how some, the idea of counterexample direct conflict rectification. So here is some circuit where again I'm trying to quantify out this y, and I first replace the negation y with y hat, right? So it was a negation y which I replaced with y hat, and then I find that here is one counterexample which is an assignment to the other variables which makes output behave like this, and all I do is I say okay, there's a counterexample to conflict freeness. And I just add a new circuit here, which is really recognizing this and negating this. Right? And I can just conjoin it, add it to the output. And then this, and this theorem which says that this new circuit is going to be semantically equivalent to the original circuit and it has strictly few counterexamples to conflict things. And so if I keep doing this, I'll eventually render the entire circuit conflict free. But of course, this is like saying find every assignment and add another circuit to it. We can do better than this. Uh, yeah. So once I do this, the original counterexample to conflict freeness is no longer a counterexample. But instead of doing it one at a time, I can actually, you know, we have some techniques which can say that, for example, for the same circuit from the same counterexample, we can find a smaller circuit which covers many more counterexamples. It's just making some observations about what is happening. I mean, it, it really doesn't matter what the leaves are. It really matters what, for example, this node and this node and this node evaluates. Right? Because that's what is finally going to make y and y hat show. All right. So let's uh, and yeah. So 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 really the the condition which we call the normal form, which we call is Synthesis negation normal form, which says that I mean that, that I showed for one output. Now this is for multiple outputs. So if I take a general output, I replace these whatever bars or hats, uh, and I ask, can it be ever equal to this? But for multiple outputs, there are some side technical conditions that when I'm checking this, I have to I can set all of these to ones, and these are the parts where I'm looking for some Yeah. Right. So maybe what I'll do is but all of them are hard for any Yeah, so I'm making an epic oracle calls. Yeah. So so remember there is a lower bound on the synthesis problem. And I'm saying that once I compile it to this form, quantification is easy and therefore scoling basis is easy, therefore finding all scoling functions is easy. So I have to have worst case uh, interaction. Okay, since I have 10 minutes, maybe what I'll do is maybe I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just go through this example very quickly. Uh, so this is uh, something with two outputs. And uh, if you look at this, this is not a binary decision diagram. There are other normal forms that people have studied in the literature, something called decomposable negation normal form, weak decomposable. So it, I mean, let's not get into those, but this is a circuit which doesn't have any of those properties. But then if I take this output ordering, right, then I see that, well, I can't get y1 and negation y1 over here because there's no negation y1, so I'm doing good. And then when I go to y2, I'm allowed to set y1 to 1 because for multiple outputs, that is the site condition I showed, right, that when I'm here, I can set all of these two ones, and this is trying to make the condition weaker. Uh, and so, so in this case, I can set it to one, and now y two and y two one cannot meet up there. Thank you. 
So this turns out to be uh, in synthesis negation of normal form with respect to this ordering. But if I flip the ordering, uh, it won't be because now if I consider y2 first, indeed there is an assignment on the other variables that makes it look like y2 negation. Right? Uh, so, so the same circuit can be in this normal form with respect to an ordering. So the order is important or it may not be. Uh, and here is some uh, results that we have. So this is the synthesis negation normal form, and these are some other things that have been studied in the literature. So there are some conditional uh, succinctness results, uh, and there are some unconditional succinctness results. Uh, but this uh, clearly subsumes all of those. Uh, yeah, and you know, I mean, th this is, I guess, follows from what we already said that if I already have this in this normal form, I can actually existentially quantify out a variable just by setting right, the variable in the bar of the variable of the hat of the variable to one. And once I do that, uh, you know, I can generate the A and the B very efficiently. And I can, in, in fact, take the A to be a scolin function. And this is how it will look like. So I mean, this is just saying that once you have it in this negation normal form, uh, the, the total circuit which generates the scolem functions for all the m output variables, it just m times the size of the original circuit and it uses just order m squared additional wires. So everything is set up there. And uh, okay, so I guess. Yeah, so this is just to show that, you know, we said all of this, I mean, does it really occur in practice? And it turns out that, you know, we took some benchmarks, which we didn't create. I mean, these were there earlier, we have been using these benchmarks. And uh, there are actually lots of them where outputs are just units. Okay? And there are lots of them where there are no conflicts at all. I mean, the semantic condition for conflicts that we check. And so it's very easy to quantify things out and uh, obtain this code analysis. And then we also had some comparison with, uh, you know, a tool with some other things. This is, if I compile to BDDs, if I compile to something called sequential decision diagrams, which also have this property, all of those are subsumed, uh, you can do much better. Okay. Uh, and uh, interestingly, I mean, we are getting this code basis, which can represent all code functions. So one could ask, how much performance penalty am I paying if I were to just synthesize one score? It turns out that it is not too much. I mean, of course, there is some penalty. I mean, in about half the time, we can go much beyond half of the state of the heart. Okay. And uh, I'll just quickly end, you know, last two, three slides that can we get a necessary and sufficient condition? This was a necessary condition. So essentially, we are asking this question that does there exist a class C star of circuits? Right. And uh, I say semantical universal so that every, every Boolean function has a representation of this class such that this uh, problem is polytime for C star. Uh, and for every class C such that C is polytime, like VDDs or synthesis negation normal form. Uh, so this is polytime. If I know the any circuit in C can be compiled to a circuit in C polytime, and uh, yeah, and this is poly size, which means it generates polynomial size circuits, not necessarily taking polynomial time, but take exponential times or exponential time. So. Poly size for C, if and only if every circuit in C compiles to a corresponding poly size. So we're asking, does there exist such a class two star of circuits, which would be like kind of the holy grail, right? That any class that you take which admits efficient compilation can be transformed to a circuit into this. In every circuit there can be transformed efficiently. Uh, and in that class, this is uh, polynomial time. And the answer to this is a yes, there exists such a class which turns out to be a bit more technical than compared to what I showed for synthesis negation normal form. And so, so let me not get into the, I mean, the picture looks similar, but there are some other technical things. Uh, 
Uh, and this turns out to be a necessary and sufficient condition. And of course, uh, you know, all the forms that have been studied in the literature turn out to be in this. Uh, strictly more succinct. I mean, in fact, this form is strictly more succinct even than the synthesis negation normal form. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think these more succinct principles that I've said there. Uh, operations on this, you know, how, how well do they compose that it's like this? So, disjunction is easy, not hard to see. This is all about existential quantification, but conjunction. Uh, if the supports on the variables you're quantifying are disjoint, the two parts, then it takes constant time. But otherwise, uh, it's not possible unless some condition. <clears throat> but once you have it, existentially quantifying takes linear time. Uh, but if you say that I only want to quantify y3, y7, and y9, that doesn't necessarily take linear time. You want to quantify it. Then in this order, it takes linear time. Okay, and uh, how to check if a given specification is in this form? It is going to be complete if the order is given to you, and it's going to be hard and it's going to be there's a free gap there uh, otherwise. So with that, I think I'll end. And then you know we have compilation algorithms. Let me not get into that. Uh, yeah, so I'll just conclude. Uh, so we have these compilation algorithms, which, yeah, I, I think, yeah. Um, let me just conclude. There was some interesting application, which is related to the factoring. We haven't solved the factoring problem yet, of course, but there is some partial results in that direction, which we can use, which we can get using this form. And this partial result says that, you know, can I represent some of the bits, not all of the bits of the product? Right? Or can I have this equivalence in some of the bits? Um, okay, so conclude. There are some new normal forms. They have some nice properties. We have some compilation algorithms. And uh, for the, we have the algorithm for compilation to synonym. This to solve this still ongoing. There are some complexity gaps that need to be plugged. And going beyond the Boolean case, this is, of course, another story for another time. And there it turns out that most of the things are not even completed. Forget about addition. So, OK, thanks. Class form seems to be a more natural class. You can describe it to us. Can you study this problem? Does it also occur naturally in other contexts, or has this similar class been elsewhere, or this is the first time this class is? Uh, so, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first time. Okay. Because it seems very natural with this, given the three necessary and sufficient conditions. This is. So, and, and I'll tell you, I mean, my understanding of why it may not have been looked at exactly like the way we looked at, yeah, let me just go to that slide, is uh, essentially what we figured out is that synthesis and existential quantification are two sides of the same coin. If you can do one thing efficiently, you can do the other thing efficiently and vice versa. And therefore, we said, okay, let's focus on quantification. And that is the one operation that I really care about. The other uh, uh, you know, knowledge combined forms that are there in the literature have not tried to focus on this one goal. There are other things like whatever you want to count the models, like verities are good for that, or you want to uh, what, do other things. Right? So uh, I think because we said that, okay, this is the one property that we care about, or this is the one operation that we care about. Uh, therefore, this led us naturally to this. I think in the other work, it's not necessarily this one operation. People have tried to come up with more ambitious goals. So they want to get something which will be good for counting, which will be good for projected counting. All of this. Yeah. And that's my understanding. But to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time. And at least the reviewers also agree that it's the first time. Yeah. 
So shouldn't it be just a conjunction of those as a specific yeah, so that one thing so we can always reduce take that problem reduce uh, this kind of an instance right? state that but, but but does having indic I don't know what independent means here, but does having independent relations does that is there a possibility that will help? So you're saying that, uh, okay, so we can understand. So are you saying that I really have one big specification, but I factored it out into parts? And Maybe alternatively, I give you various distinct specifications that are also independent in some sense that I don't, I don't know what. Right, right. right. And we are looking for common solutions. Common solutions. So the fact that we have, quote unquote, independent constraints here, uh, independent on the same way, on the same set of data. In fact, um, yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, so you know, if, if I could find the scolem basis for each one of them, then a common solution is something that, you know, the, the onset has to be common and the don't care set has to be common. But it, it's probably easier to find the scolem basis for each one of them because maybe they're individually simpler. Uh, we haven't tried that uh, in, in this setting, but uh, we have tried something in a different setting where we take these factored specifications, which is essentially kind of what you're talking about. So there you start from one and you break it into Yes, uh, and there it, I mean, we haven't tried computing the scolem basis. So the problem that we tried was give, give me one scolem function, which works for all of them. And there it does indeed help to factor it out. It, it helps. In terms of actual performance that we see, the worst case, of course, it depends by. But uh, now that you mentioned, I think yeah, I could compute this column basis separately and then just uh, find something in the common. Building on this, I mean, I guess the one of the reasons it might help with respect to the factoring thing is because there are certain normal forms where we know we can compute the column basis addition. Yes, but it may be the case that even though the individual terms satisfy the normal forms. The conjunction of all of them perhaps does not. Exactly. And a conjunction is the difficult operation. Yeah. Right. So conjunction is bad. I guess I had it somewhere. So like, even in the, like the specific context of that, integer factoring, okay. So yeah. they're having, I mean, trying to factor one integer versus trying to factor a uh, you know, common factor of two integers, these are problems that are vastly yeah. different. If I'm given two integers, I want a common factor, that's the GCD problem. That can solve. Significantly, then more efficiently in that factoring. So, so, yeah, that's what I meant. I mean, just having independent, because it, for this example, really. I see. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I haven't thought about that. But, so, you're saying that bringing in more factors can help. Yeah, the, this is a. Like, I mean, can uh, help in the sense of the worst case complexity has come down. Or maybe you could. Uh, because we have different constraints, perhaps we could solve a, a similar problem for maybe more complicated circuit classes. But mm -hmm. I don't really know what I think. No, no, I, I think, yeah. I, the factoring yeah. example is what I had in mind. Yeah, I, mean, I haven't thought about it at all, but yeah, maybe I should talk to you more about it. Yeah, sure. So, among the applications that you were talking about in the beginning, so one was this reactive circuit where you say that it can be used. Yeah. And so I was wondering that in general, that problem can also be like, it may not be able to compute, uh, like, it may not always be computable. So it may not be computable. I mean, so finding the strategy and solving the synthesis problem is often undecided. So what kind of uh, things correspond to this movie? And yeah, so I'm here say, talking about, let us say, LTL synthesis. So there is no undecidability there. It's too expensive. <laughs> Okay, so the MTL synthesis will like, it can be modeled as a yeah. Yes. So essentially you whatever build the game graph, you find the winning region in the game graph. So your this quantification of the formal and where they exist will correspond to some kind of strategies. Uh, yeah, so the scoring function will give the strategy. 
So it is saying for every state, what is the output that I choose? For every state, for every input, what is the output that I choose? So that is the strategy. And the multiplicity of scolium functions means the multiplicity of strategies. Uh, and the fact that we know that scolium functions have a scolium basis, it means all the strategies have a certain uniform representation. And so, for example, we can count strategies. It's just okay. So the count is essentially the number of scolium functions that. <clears throat> Uh, exactly. The count of strategies. Exactly. It's the count of numbers. So for, for a single output, it's just two raised to the don't care set, two raised to the size of B. Right? Because everything has to include A and you can include anything. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. So, 